Alrighty, Life is Strange. The series about middle-aged men's interpretations of angsty wannabe hipster teenage girls. So, Season 1 and 2 were made by the same team at Don't Nod, I believe, and the spin-off Before the Storm and this game, True Colors, were made by Deck 9 or something like that. Now to get some groundwork out of the way, so you know where I'm coming from, Season 1 of Life is Strange is both horrible and also kind of novel and enjoyable. The writing, the pacing, the dialogue, it's all so bad, so very bad. It's a genuine embarrassment to watch unfold a lot of the time. But as the story keeps going, they start to get a bit more ambitious with what they're doing. Episode 4 of Season 1 sudden, just suddenly has good pacing for no reason, and a lot of baller shit happens in it. And then Episode 5 is back to having complete nonsensical pacing with no ability to develop tension due to bouncing back and forth between false threats and no consistent like through line, anything like that. But Life is Strange Season 1 also has a distinct tone and a vibe that's very unlike most other video games, even visual novel adventure game type shit. It's no secret that Season 2 is a fucking joke, it has no redeeming qualities at all, and it's painfully boring. Now, there is some contention regarding Before the Storm. I've seen some people dislike it because, and validly, there are very few straightforwardly likable characters in it. Everyone is kind of an asshole, but not like a funny asshole like in Bully or something. You really just can't root for anyone. However, Before the Storm tells by far and away the most interesting drama of these games. Its ideas and events and themes are all very different from most stories you've consumed in your life. The pacing is fucking excellent, and Deck Nine performed the absolutely Herculean feat of keeping the same cringy-ass wannabe hipster tone and dialogue of the original, but somehow making it more bearable. I cannot overstate how impressive it is to do this without totally changing how the game feels on the outside. Before the Storm also has far more novelty than other games. It has some bizarre cool shit, creative ideas for storytelling, actually powerful dramatic scenes that feel exciting to watch, and a much more organized, complete structure to the story, as everything feels like it fits into place and complements everything else, and all aspects of the story feel intentional and feed into each other. So, Deck Nine, clearly the superior writing talent, and I have had decent expectations for this upcoming game. So how is it? Well. I'm not terribly impressed, if I'm being honest. There isn't much here that's really egregiously bad like in Season 1 or 2, but there also isn't anything as engaging as the wackier shit in Season 1. You know, this wasn't even close to the best thing I played this year titled True Colors. <laughs> that was also the name of the most recent episode of Season 2 of Being a Dick, which was phenomenal in every way, and I loved it and would perform ritual sacrifices over how fucking great it is. So, yeah, pretty disappointing. Pointing. By the way, there will be spoilers in this review because I need to talk about some things that require me to spoil the plot, and I wouldn't care even if I had no reason to spoil the plot, but... So, to start with, I'd say the best part about this game is the main character's voice actress. Now, I've never heard anyone on the voice cast for this game, I've never heard of them at all, but the lead does an excellent job. You see, good acting comes in a lot of different forms. Most of the time when people talk about good acting, they're referring to some specific scene where an actor gets to go all out and be very expressive or something. Sometimes it's about how the actor is able to convey so much through their acting throughout the entire media, like say, Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight, or like... Anthony Starr as Homelander and The Boys, or like um, Alan Rickman's performance as Snape in Harry Potter, you know, performances that are operating at 100% at all times. But good acting can also just be found in just like making everything work the way it's supposed to. Like a blender that purees food for fucking old people with no teeth so that they can eat it. A great actor can make something work that another actor would stumble over, and that is what I find most impressive about Alex's acting in this game. She is the only character that consistently manages to say all these stupid fucking cringy lines of dialogue, but the acting makes it sound almost genuine a lot of the time. Like, you could- it, it sounds like you might actually hear a human being say these things. 
I know if I were reading some of these fucking lines off of a script, I would be totally lost. I would have no fucking clue how to save them. But, I mean, yeah, she's also a good actress in all the other ways that you might imagine, too. She really knocks it out of the park in this game. Good acting contributes a lot to a character's likability in, in a lot of media, and this is no exception. The biggest problem with this game is that pretty much everything in it feels half-baked to some degree. Everything is underdeveloped, you feel next to no connection to any of it, I don't remember the last game I played where I couldn't even recall all the characters' names, and this game only has like nine characters in it or something like that, and I still can't remember half their names. They feel that disconnected and just like, like void. Alex is the only character I even like a little. Everyone else is totally forgettable. Alex is only likable because of good voice acting. There's nothing about her character that makes her endearing, per se. She's actually kind of annoying due to her constant repetition of her single-minded wannabe hipster ideological fucking ventings. One of the main reasons everything feels forgettable is because of the bad pacing. I wouldn't say I was bored playing this game, but like, almost nothing happens each episode. Okay, let's take episode two. And keep in mind, each episode out of the five is like over two hours long, about two hours. In episode two, this is what happens. There is a short scene for Gabe's funeral, or wake, or whatever the fuck they call it, I don't even know what that is. Then Alex has some forced scene with his other girl character that doesn't really matter much, uh, just to establish that they're like friends or whatever. What's her fucking name? Steph? I had to look it up. I literally just looked it up. Uh, part of the problem with these characters, and, and these scenes, is that these characters are all pretty much expendable from the plot. See, you have two friend characters, but they're both barely in the game at all, because you have the choice as a player for which one you want to be romantically involved with, so you get more scenes with that person, but like, neither one of them really matters. They're both expendable from the plot, because both of them might not be the character that you choose to hang out with more, so they both equally don't matter. <laughs> as a result, yeah, neither one matters, they could be cut entirely, you feel this very much while playing. There's some episodes where they just don't have scenes at all. Like, they just don't show up. You just do nothing with them. So anyways, you have a forgettable scene with this girl character purely for them to prompt you as the player to ask if you want to have romantic interest in them in the future, which means that they... It doesn't matter to the main story. Then Alex walks down the street. Then she has a brief conversation with a character that basically won't show up ever again, where she learns a simple thing about, uh, uh, about the death of her brother. A simple fact to the mystery. Very, very, very basic fact to the mystery. Then she goes to talk to the other friend character that is barely in the story as well, and won't really ever matter again after this scene if you don't choose to hang out with him. And you talk about how he feels bad. And like, that's it. That was the episode. That was a whole two hour episode. Funeral. Walk down the street. Learn one very simple fact. One heart to heart. Done. Whole episode. The entire episode is like walking down a street. And that's it. That's all you do. That walking down the street segment is the bulk of it. Because you can choose to have all these small meaningless scenes with other characters that also barely matter and barely get any screen time at all. Like, nothing is developed at all. You actually get- you, you, you get so little to actually build on or grow to appreciate the characters, and they have maybe two or three scenes each in the entire game. And then they go back to not existing, basically. By the time I got to the ending where it's like, oh, now I have this town that loves me and I can stay here and be part of this community, I could not give less of a shit. I felt anti-satisfaction from it, because I felt so little attachment to fucking anything that happened or any of these forgettable characters or this setting. Even when you have scenes with characters, it, fe it either feels meaningless because it just feels like setting something up for later that they won't really do much with, even though they won't... Yeah, it's just like a pro like solving a problem in two seconds. There's a conflict with Ryan, for instance, where he feels frustration and self-hatred or guilt or whatever because he m feels like he might have been able to save Gabe's life, but he made an executive decision that would have certainly gotten Gabe killed. Except I'm lying. Calling it a conflict is being too kind, because it's not some sort of ongoing dilemma or complexity to his character or adjustment over the story. It's literally a single scene. One scene after Gabe died, where we talk to Ryan, we do the stupid emotion power thing, and then he gets over it. It's resolved. Never comes up again. This is pretty much how all the conflicts are with the meaningless side characters, which is most of the game. 
uh, not including all the time that you waste just looking at something that doesn't matter in the environment and having some meaningless line played uh, uh, in the dialogue. You pop in, set something up for later that won't even be satisfying later because you still don't give a shit about them as a person and they won't matter after you conclude it, or the decision has next to no real consequence, or you learn a problem and then immediately solve it, again, to no satisfaction or long-term attachment to a character. Any episode feels like it just could cut 90% of the cast, and that would be, like, natural to, 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 to what's happening. Um, unfortunately, that basically covers the vast majority of the game's actual runtime. It can be all summed up by that. I could talk about the individual conflicts of each character, but I feel so detached and uninterested by them that I have nothing to say good or bad about any of them. They, they don't even feel like they warrant discussion. As for the more mainline parts of the story, like the main plot, Alex, and the powers and stuff, it's also kind of aimless. Since so little uh, really happens in each episode, it's hard to feel any sense of significance to the plot. I feel like everything that you learn or do in the story to solve the mystery could have been done in a single montage scene of a TV show. It's so minimal. The, the mystery is one of the least complex I've ever seen. I was going to complain about the flawed logic of the mystery and the twist at the end and whatnot, but sitting here now, I feel such ambivalent nothingness like towards the fucking whole thing that I don't even care about exposing the weird plot holes that much. It just doesn't matter. If you're going into this game expecting something clever with how Alex's powers are supposed to work, think again. In episode one, it's attempted to establish Alex as a fundamentally troubled girl who has difficulty with emotional stability, and she is literally forced to experience the emotions of others regardless of her own feelings. If someone else feels like being violent, she will be violent. If someone else is a delusional idiot raving about fucking Flat Earth, she would probably feel the same sense of ego and disillusionment with reality if she were in their presence. The problem is, this is literally just for the first episode, and this is not how it works for the rest of the game. After that, Alex ha never has a single moment of not having 100% full control over her emotions. Like, she experiences the feeling of complete self-doubt and confusion from a woman with dementia, but instead of freaking out about it or being confused or questioning everything that she's seeing, Alex is just totally chill and composed and calmly observing everything around her. She just stops being affected by other people's emotions for no reason and instead can just observe them with no effect to her attitude or personality at all. It just becomes a boring way to have self-contained scenes where she just learns something about a character and then helps them through it and then they never fucking talk about it again. It's just like mind reading that only triggers whenever it's convenient for the plot. More so, Alex basically doesn't have her character explored at all through most of the story. The first and last episodes try to paint her as this emotionally unstable girl seeking connection and acceptance, and with all this self-doubt and regret and shit like that. But for 80% of the game, she's just a totally emotionally healthy, hard-working, wannabe hipster girl who has no trouble wh whatsoever in any social situations, no trouble with emotional availability or communication. She's just a generally pretty flawless, like, fucking hero who goes around helping people with no internal struggle of her own. That's most of the game. But then it suddenly wants to make the story about Alex's insecurities right at the very end. Alex just basically feels like all of the other Life is Strange protagonists, most of the time. You control her, you're not limited in any way, so just by nature of being a player and doing everything, Alex just feels like a very socially adjusted and outgoing charismatic person, which makes no sense. I mean, sure, half of all of her dialogue is either literally nothing, talking about fucking nothing, or just her making the same snide remarks about how Typhon is evil, but still, she just feels like a wannabe hipster every woman with no internal conflict, just going on incredibly short, underdeveloped adventures. Anything that there might have been in this game is so underdeveloped that it basically means nothing. Even if you want to buy into Alex having this internal conflict consistently through the game, which she doesn't, it still wouldn't be interesting in the last episode. It's still just a cookie cutter storyline for a character you've seen countless times before in other media. I really can't recall a single thing in the whole game that I have any strong feeling towards, positive or negative. I wasn't planning on making like a negatively biased review while I was playing it, or even immediately after I finished it, but it's undeniable that 
that's sitting here now. I'll barely remember anything about this game in a fucking week. It just feels so scattered with its time. It wastes so much time on meaningless bullshit or nothing Berg side stories. The main story is mind-numbingly simplistic once it's actually, once you understand it. It's b fucking baffling that this story took like nine hours to tell. There's no structure to most of the content. Nothing builds alongside anything else. There's so much that you could just cut entirely. Most of the time you just have to ignore the fact that everything else in the story we're just gonna not talk about it until it until we just happen to act like it's relevant again you probably won't dislike this game while playing it unless you hate cringy dialogue um but i don't know if many people could possibly have any strong connection to this game at all like i said it's like you know it's like not as bad as season one but it's also not as appealing as season one's good attributes were it's also way more ham-fisted with its approach to the main conflict. Like, season one had a cartoonishly evil villain, but most of the plot was about, like, random shit, random conflicts here and there, vaguely circling around this missing girl plot, etc. It didn't feel any sense of urgency most of the time, which contributes to the chill vibe that it gives. And the plot didn't feel like it was beating you over the head with where it was going. In this game, you're just, like, complaining about this cartoonishly evil corporation the whole game. That's basically all you do. You just point out things to complain about with this corporation, and it never changes. It's just the same, fuck Typhon, they smell bad, type dialogue over and over again. This never changes or develops in any way. It's not, like, altered in the ending. This black and white perspective is the only one the game has. It starts where it ends, basically. Typhon is evil for a person whose power is literally feeling other people's feelings and like being empath empathic Alex is extremely judgmental as a person but not in a way that it's like a character trait it's just kind of weird that she's not very understanding of the people that she looks at unless they're specifically feeling fear anger or sadness any other emotion anything like guilt or nervousness to a situation like any other emotion or just like a complex emotion it won't register she can only empathize with people when the plot feels like letting her empathize with them and read their minds the plot doesn't make much sense but i also stopped caring as it went along so i can't claim that i was paying as close attention as i usually do like i didn't stop to read every single journal entry and every note like i did in some other games in like season one the initial mystery hook is kind of compelling, because obviously no one could have been trying to kill Gabe specifically since any one of them could have died in the accident, not just him, or they all could have been fine. And it's not like Gabe was set up into going into the mountain, so you immediately wonder what the point of it is, what the goal is, and why it went down this way. Unfortunately, this is deeply satisfying in multiple ways. Unsatisfying. Like, Typhon's reputation gets shat to hell because of this accidental death, so it seems like they risked being hated by the public to do whatever it is they did that you don't know. Which makes you feel like it's a big deal, you know, like what the fuck is more important to them than their actual public rep reputation as a corporation. And as it was going on, my theory eventually became that it would be like a Breaking Bad situation. I thought Typhon Mining was going to be a front for a much more lucrative kingpin illegal business like Gus Fring with Los Pollos Hermanos. And that's why they were willing to do all of this for whatever reason. Either that or they'd be doing some real weird ritual religious bullshit and it would be tied into the supernatural stuff going on with Alex, but nope. Uh, quick side note, let's see. In Life is Strange, the powers become the center of the plot at the end. You know, like, the, the title is Life is Strange. It's referring to the weird-ass powers. The plot manipulation must all be undone for the good of everything. You know, like, um, the supernatural elements become the focus in Season 1. The grounds of the story. Before, before the Storm doesn't have any supernatural elements at all, and I never finished the shit show that was Season 2, so I have no idea if the story explained or did anything about why the powers exist or did anything with them at all but in this the powers just are there they have no explanation they don't matter to the plot at all except the fact that they're occasionally useful to alex the plot is not about anything supernatural at all which just makes everything just bizarre in retrospect why the, the, this power exists or is in the plot but anyways yeah so i thought to this mystery i thought the only logical answer was that it would get more wild, but instead, it just doesn't make sense. 
apparently Typhon, uh, for one, they used they they used a blast, the blast to cover another explosion, which is again something they did in Better Call Saul, which also made me think of Gus's Criminal Empire. But they controlled the blasts, both of them. So why couldn't they have just delayed both blasts like an hour or two or a day or so? I, I know for a fact that they, they didn't have the inspections for at least a few days. They had the permit that allowed them to do the blast. They could have done it whenever the fuck they wanted, the next day, anything. Literally, there is still no explanation given for why they couldn't have just delayed the blast. Which is the only reason the plot happened in the first place. Because they were told to delay the blast and they chose not to and got people killed in the process by blasting it while there were still people in the blast zone. And the only reason... Th There's no reason given for why they couldn't have just delayed the blast. It makes no sense. But anyways, beyond that, they did this to cover up accidental deaths in their mine from working from years ago. Granted, this was like at least a dozen workers. Not a huge, huge number, but still more than one person. So I guess having the public think that you killed Gabe and risking killing other people as well is slightly better than thinking you were, you irresponsibly let 12 or so of your own workers die in your mine a couple of years ago. But it's still bizarre that they're doing this only to protect their reputations and hide this accident. And they do so by letting another accident happen in plain sight, getting more, their reputation shat on and more people to hate them. And, and, and want and more people to want to prove that you're lying about this accident because many people will know that you're lying like what what is the goal what is the their fucking motivation makes no sense to do this I don't know why they hid the mine collapse in the first place for one I don't understand how they did it did all of the people who died in the mining accident just not have any friends or family that asks them where the fuck they went how did they hide the fact that these people are literally dead and a bunch of their employees just like meant went missing all at once? How did they cover that up? How did no one ask anything? How, is, how, how, how did they hide the fact that a bunch of people died on the job? But why did they protect Jed as well? Just some fucking guy who worked for them. Jed fucked up, it's his fault, why not just out him? Jed isn't even remotely important, he has no sway or influence within the company, surely. I don't get any of this. And even if it did make slightly more logical sense, it'd still be a big letdown for a mystery that started as a corporate conspiracy with a willingness to kill people. When the resolution of the plot is just that some people died. That makes no sense. I see nothing in here that warrants a company to fucking kill people. To cover up. Also, it's been years. Was there really not a better way to hide the evidence? Couldn't you just melted the bodies with acid or done literally anything else? I can't even believe that like wild animals didn't just wander into the mines and eat the fucking corpses. There are so many places where this letdown of a plot twist from every angle just doesn't hold up in the first place. Jed is also very underdeveloped as a character and his underdeveloped emotional state is thrown into a hasty comparison to Alex's similarly rushed characterization thing at the end of the story, and the whole climax feels weak and also obnoxiously drawn out. Everything about the ending after Alex leaves the mine felt like overwhelmingly unsatisfying in every way, and not in like, and not in a good feeling unsatisfying like the end of a depressing movie or something like Mother or It Comes at Night, but just like, it wants me to care and feel good, but there's nothing to feel. There's just nothing there. There's really weird, misplaced Spartacus moments with these fucking council members based on if you did the maybe one or two things with each character that existed in the whole game, and they choose to support Alex or not, which also feels unsatisfying and pretty dumb since you're basically watching like a Twitter argument of hearsay bullshit until Alex just uses her Jedi mind powers and everything the scene has been doing is rendered pointless. It all feels like scenes that the game never earned, you know? And 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 the ending the game, it, it didn't earn it because you, you didn't actually grow any real attachment to these towns or the, the people in the three or four times you spoke to them over these nine hours. I had a lot of other thoughts while playing this game, but they all feel pointless now because nothing ever felt developed to the point of being noteworthy. Everything in the game is kind of charming and fun. I generally like Alex. I didn't hate anything in the game really but could i recommend this game probably not no 
The actress that plays Alex is really fucking good. I think her name is Erica Mori. She does a great job, but that's all I really have to say on the game. I'd sooner recommend Season 1 to observe the insanity of its structure than I would to recommend this. In the end, Before the Storm is still by far and away the best Life is Strange game. Just one that might not be everyone's cup of tea.